All right, good morning. I think we'll get started. We still have some a few people joining us, but I think we'll uh, get to the, the meat of the subject today. Again, Meg Ryan with the Utah League of Cities and Towns. Thank you so much for joining us here today at our uh, third day of our partner conference with Utah APA and with Wasatch Front Regional Council. Well, we appreciate your attendance and participation. Our topic today is accessory dwelling units, and I am very pleased to have some panelists with us today to present to you. But we will start off with a couple of housekeeping items, which is one, if you could please use the chat box throughout the session for any questions, we will be monitoring that and hopefully get all your answers question, uh, questions answered. And I've also posted a link to the PDF presentation in the chat box as well. If you'd like to uh, download that on your own, it will also be available on the uh, app, the Crowd Compass app that you've been using to register. And then just another reminder that all of these sessions will be available um, after the conference so that if you're missing another session right now, um, don't worry, you'll have a chance to see it. So uh, we're going to just pop up a generic poll. We're happy to have Gabe, our tech, helping us here today. And we're just going to take a look and see where who we've got on the call with us this morning. <clears throat> And while we do that again, we're going to have about an hour and 15 here to get through the topic and have some discussion. So it looks like we've got some answers and maybe if we want to share that we can end it and bring it up on the screen. I think I guess I can do that. So if you guys can see the results here, we've got a few mayors, great council members, a lot of city staff, uh, no attorneys, that's great. So we can be free in our conversation and get all the world's <laughs> problems solved, uh, planning commissioners, and then those who just love our league conferences. Excellent. Um, so I'm very, very pleased today to have here uh, some ex experts in the field and some dedicated city uh, staff. We've got uh, Jake Young with Salt Lake County. We've got John Jansen uh, with APA Utah and the Fraternal Order of Wandering Planners, uh, never finding a home, but always showing up in your city. We've got Aaron O'Kelly from Mill Creek and we've got Daniel Cardenas from Pleasant Grove. So I will turn it over to John. And again, please use the chat box and thank you so much for all being here today. So good morning, everyone. Uh, we also have that one other question in there, too. Um, we're wondering if you already have an accessory dwelling unit uh, ordinance in your community. Maybe, uh, Gabriel, you could uh, get us the answers to that one, too. And Meg, you are muted. I think we just have to bring up the poll, the second poll. He'll bring that up, and then we can all take it. Okay. Thank you. If you could do that, Gabe, that would be appreciated. I, I apologize. I don't have a second poll on okay. here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so well, as we have a conversation about this, uh, maybe you could just let us know in the chat room if you have an ordinance already. That would be an easy way to go. So Jake, could you bring up the slideshow? You bet. I just posted that question as well. Um, so if we're our participants want to just put in the chat their, their city name and and where they are with the ordinance and where they're going thank you paul <laughs> first one out of the gate <laughs> and it's always good to ain't got no um there we go uh, okay so big screen all right uh next slide So here's what we're going to try to accomplish, okay? Um, I've found uh, in uh, meetings in Mill Creek, as a matter of fact, and meetings uh, around uh, in a few different communities, that there really are a lot of myths about uh, ADUs and issues about them. Um, maybe the only way to try and address some of that is uh, by having some actual good facts and information that you can deal with. 
Um, so Jake is going to talk a bit about uh, some of the research that he's done. Um, and I'm going to move this poll out of my way. <laughs> Let's see. I'll put almost. Yeah, we should have had almost on there too. Um, so uh, then uh, we have a, a short section on what are the general components of a uh, ADU ordinance. And uh, that is presented to you in a way where there's community decisions to make. Um, then we're gonna learn from Aaron about uh, a community, Mill Creek, that is really trying hard to get an ADU ordinance. And then we're gonna learn from Daniel about a community that's had one for an awful long time. And uh, I think uh, that variety ought to help everybody, whether you're fixing up your ordinance to meet SB 34 or you're wanting to create one. Let's move on. Or, okay, just a quick definition. Um, habitable, okay, so this is not just a room in your house. This is something that, you know, has the, um, a kitchen and a bathroom, um, bedroom, maybe it's still a studio, but it's, uh, you know, attached or detached and it's subordinate to the home that's there. Moving on. And it's got a few names. <laughs> and uh, let's see, Meg, uh, I think, aren't you in your she shed? I think you are, yes, maybe. Um, anyhow, uh, lots of different names. Um, Jake, I think, put this together and uh, the Fonzie flat, I'd forgotten all about that, even though I'm the oldest one on the panel. So we'll move on. Lots of names. Moving on. Okay. And I guess we're moving past the shoe humor. That's fine, too. Um, so some pictures of uh, generally what they look like. Uh, you know, obviously, we did particularly good pictures. Uh, here, but uh, these are, in my mind, they look like uh, conversions of garages. Um, uh, but that is one way where they're detached from the home, uh, usually in the back, sometimes in the side yard. Moving on. Uh, we do have them over garages, whether they're detached or not. Uh, it's a fairly common way that you see them. Next one. Um, Sandy City provided this uh, detached look uh, here, excuse me, attached to the house. This is an addition in the back. Sometimes you see these on the side. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, basement apartment, I think is the most common one. And again, these look a lot better than the ones I've seen. How's that? <laughs> uh, having uh, been involved in that at one point. So. Uh, Jake's going to talk some about uh, some research that he's done for Salt Lake County and uh, from some other areas that I think will help with some of the myths that are out there. Thank you, John. Um, so at, at Salt Lake County, uh, we've done some research on ADUs, knowing that it could be a, a, a very viable housing option to increase housing stock and help us with the housing gap. And uh, we've now done this same survey twice, uh, first done at the end of 2017, and then just recently updated during COVID, and, and hopefully some of you participated in it. Uh, we, we launched this near the beginning of the shutdown, and, and we had to send it out a couple times to get responses. But uh, thanks to Meg and the Utah League of Cities and Towns, uh, we received 88 uh, different responses. Here's a map showing the different communities that participated in the survey, towns, cities, counties throughout the state. So this gives us a good variety of what, what kind of the status is of ADUs in Utah. Uh, first question, does your city or town permit accessory dwelling units in one or more zones? About 65% of the respondents said yes, and 35% said no. This kind of tells you that in Utah, Right now, about two thirds of the communities do permit ADUs, and and this number has been growing a little bit over the past few past few years, and is going to continue to grow. And I'll show some some additional information later on about that. If ADUs are permitted, what approximate percentage of residential zones allow them? And 
this graph is a little confusing, but you'll notice here on the right, well, on the left, it is the percentage of that community, and then the bar shows what percent. So the majority of, of the cities do have them in most of the residential zones. Then, then the yellow and the blue and the green show that a smaller percentage of the municipalities have it in less zones. And, and, and this is looking at percentage of all residential. So the, the takeaway on this slide is that most cities, when they permit an ADU, they're doing it for the whole community and not just a few zones. However, there is that option. If you want to try it out in a few zones and get it going, that's not a bad way to go either. Um, if ADUs are permitted, what type? So the bar on the left, detached, you know, that, that's a separate unit. That's the tiny house or the casita, or there's all kind of granny flat, lots of names for that. About 60% allow detached. Um, in the middle is attached, 80%, that's being the most common. And then the other and responses were, instead of it being permitted as conditional use or certain things like that, so there's a process to get there through conditional uses. So typically attached is more common and detached a little less common, but a lot of cities and communities um, allow for both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It, your ordinance can allow for both. Oh. If ADUs are permitted, what occupancy types are allowed? Um, so, so what, you know, how can you live in them or how, rent them or whatever? Um, on the left is long-term rental, somebody that's going to be there more than a month, multiple months. That's about 75%. Um, less in the middle there in the blue is short-term rental. That's uh, Airbnb and things like that, using it for ADUs. That's about 45% percent, 42 percent for short-term rental. Uh, primary residence, meaning that if the owner of the ADU wants to live in the ADU and rent out the bigger part of the house, um, that's also about 73 percent. So very comparable to the long term. And then the other was just some miscellaneous ideas in terms of nuances of it. But this gives you the main idea that, that in general ADUs are used for long-term rentals, primary residence, and then some communities do allow them for short-term rentals. So um, th this question was, if ADUs are permitted, how many in your community? Trying to get an idea. And you'll notice that the biggest thing here is unknown number of ADUs. Uh, this tells me that in particular, not all cities or many communities are actually tracking ADUs. And I think it would be a, a good thing that if you're using a business permit to get your ADU or some other type of permitting that you actually track them so you know, then you can use that on reporting for affordable housing reports. You know what the, the pricing is for renting ADUs, things like that. But you'll see that the, the numbers there vary. And then the smaller number blue here, the, the middle circle there, 200 plus ADUs. So of all those 88 communities that participated, three have more than 200 accessory dwelling units. And of course, some cities will be very small and 200 wouldn't be a big number. But this gives us an idea that, that in general, it still is a very small part of our housing stock in our communities. Does your city have illegal ADUs currently in, in the city, town, or county? So please list some comments. Um, that's, I'm not going to go into the comments today, but um, do you have illegal ADUs? 40% said yes, 20% uh, said no, 19% said otherwise, and I think that's, are, are, they, are they not following the conditional use or their permit or, or just kind of the nuances and then 20% no. And, and I would, the biggest takeaway on this is that almost every community actually does have illegal ADUs. When we've had this conversation before, the Utah League of Cities and Towns have asked for a raise of hands, what cities that have illegal ADUs, and almost every hand goes up. So I think it's going to be a constant um, challenge in terms of working with the public and the population to get them properly permitted and working through. But what we're seeing is that cities that do have an ordinance, that do have a process, and allow for permits are a little bit more successful than, 
than sometimes communities that say absolutely no. But that's just a general uh, observation. It doesn't apply to every community. Are ADUs part of your housing plans, your modern income housing plan? Uh, you'll remember the SB 34 housing bill came out last year and then uh, December 1st of 2019, each city had to submit their modern income housing plan using the menu of 23 options and accessory dwelling units was one of the 23 options. 57% uh, said yes, ADUs as part of their modern income housing plan, 32% no, and then a, a few that they weren't quite sure on that. So in, in general, again, kind of that two thirds of communities do have it as part of their modern income housing plan. And I know some cities also, they, they actually already permit ADUs and they didn't see any changes in their ADU as well. But we are seeing a lot of modern income housing plans having ADUs and, and that going forward. Okay, so this question is, uh, what are the most significant challenges to the viabilities of ADUs in your city, town, or county? Check all that apply. And I wanna call out the biggest one right here. We'll just start with the top. It is assuring owner occupies one of the units if required. A lot of ordinances require owner occupancy and that is one of the biggest challenges of, of communities. How do they enforce that the owner, that if you're renting the ADU, you, you also live there. Uh, I'll call out some of the other challenges, NIMBYism, building code compliance, current ordinance issues are not allowed, that's at 38%, and then also uh, code for code informants, excuse me. Um, those are the, the major topics that communities are dealing with in terms of making ADUs a, a viable part of their housing stock. And then the last thing I wanna share is, this is a, a little bit different research. Um, at Regional Development Salt Lake County, we, we went through all of the moderate income housing plans for every community and city in Salt Lake County, prepared a report on that, analyzing all of them. And here's a summary of the 23 different menu items that were offered to cities for housing. And you'll notice E there with that blue uh, rectangle about it, that was the most popular. In Salt Lake County, all communities except for three had it in their modern income housing plan. And Salt Lake City already has ADUs in place. So not to call out any cities, but all but two actually are working towards accessory dwelling units in their city as part of their housing plan. So I think that's pretty remarkable. And looking back a few years, most of the cities in, in Salt Lake County did not permit ADUs. So we're seeing a big shift in, in Salt Lake County in terms of permitting and promoting ADUs. And it's gonna take time and a process, but certainly that's a big shift. Okay. Um... We're going to just talk for just a few minutes about the benefits of ADUs. Got a slide, please advance. Okay. Um, these are just some of the things that people talk about in terms of benefits. Um, I'm going to just let you read them so that we move along fairly quick. It's interesting that, uh, you know, that our meeting the uh, uh, SB 34 is actually on the list. Uh, let's keep going. Thank you. Uh, one of the biggest ones I think that uh, uh, becomes an important issue uh, as you develop an ordinance is the blending into the existing neighborhoods. Um, the fact that you're in a house uh, or in the backyard uh, with uh, a family, um, older adults, whatever it might be, um, the impacts I think are fairly low, although obviously that's one of the issues with the nimbyism that Jake mentioned. Let's move on. Um, I thought we'd just hit up on some big issues for a moment. Um, uh, as we know, income is just not keeping up with housing costs, right? I mean, there's really no question about that uh, these days. So does an ADU offer a way for people to get into homes and uh, you know, have some income that helps offset their mortgage? Um, and on the other hand, if you're having tough times, uh, that income from an apartment in your house or in the backyard uh, can really be uh, a lifesaver for you. 
It's really interesting to me that during this whole virus time, uh, the demand for housing has not really stopped, right? Um, you'd think that more people out of jobs, you just won't have um, uh, as many folks that are looking for homes, but it's just not the case. And uh, maybe that's because the interest rates are so low. You know, this morning I saw 2.4 was available, uh, which is just ridiculous. Um, so um, I think this whole thing of the American dream is changing somewhat. More people want to rent, don't want to deal with yards. Nice picture from Heber. Um, I think Jake did this one. <laughs> Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, maybe people don't want that uh, big backyard and big front yard to hang on to. Nationally, um, we are seeing this uh, business of having single family zones uh, being a question mark. Um, uh, we know in the past uh, we had folks, we had uh, realty companies that were, uh, uh, you know, pushing people of uh, color to different neighborhoods. Matter of fact, people of religion, different neighborhoods, all kinds of things. And, you know, that's been outlawed, but uh, you could argue that we still are income, excuse me, income discriminating in our single family zones. And uh, that's an interesting question to, that the, the nation seems to be wrapping their heads around at this point. Um, and then we have cities that have just walked away from the single family zones, that you can have the duplex, the triplex, the fourplex here and there. Um, and that's okay in those communities. So just talking about bigger issues for a minute, let's move on. Um, we're gonna get to these components. I'm gonna try and run through them fairly quickly. These are ones that are typical in most ordinances. These are the things that are usually addressed um, let's just run right through them. Uh, Jake, next one. So ownership, Jake mentioned that uh, as one of the big issues. Um, there really is a question. Uh, community, community decision about whether the owner has to live in one of the units. Um, that's actually a partial issue too. Does it have to be in the original home or can it be in the ADU? Uh, I think we're starting to see communities gravitating toward uh, it's okay if they're in either one. Uh, let's not try to control that. Um, the bigger issue, I think, is whether you're going to make an owner live there. And um, obviously, 50% of those polled in Jake's uh, uh, work um, said uh, that is a big issue. So um, that is something to grapple with in your community. And I'm going to just go to my suggestion here. Uh, this is what I've seen done in a lot of the communities is first you have a recorded agreement where the owner of the property is agreeing to stay and live in that particular uh, address and uh, that you actually do regulate, regulate it through the business license that uh, generally speaking, you know, sometimes they may have no income coming from these. These are it's grandma, you know, that's living there and there's no charge, but with a business license and a regular rental income, it is a business. So uh, they should have a annual business license uh, review and certification that happens. And that way you, you can control it and see what's going on essentially. Um, but I think that is a big issue. It is more work than your average uh, permit, I think, but, uh, it is an issue. Let's go to the next one. Um, the type allowed, uh, Jake's talked about uh, the different types. I, I talked about them, but those are decisions to make. Uh, you wanna allow the attached as an addition. Uh, you wanna only allow basement or attic apartments or you know, quadrant off some piece of your house uh, for a separate unit. Um, detached, uh, you know, we've got the tiny homes that are coming on that uh, people are putting in their backyards or even building in their backyards for that matter. Um, so um, those are community, community decisions that need to be made and uh, I'm just suggesting maybe it's easiest to start anyway with one in the home. Let's move on. Uh, size. Size is an interesting thing. Uh, I've seen a lot of these uh, all over the board, really. Uh, some ordinances have a minimum and a maximum. Some just say they have to be smaller than the home, and some have no limit. Um, 
Some of the bottom end ones I've seen have been 300 square feet, uh, but obviously that doesn't work for tiny homes. If you're gonna do a detached tiny home, those are generally in the 200-ish square foot range. So uh, that's something that you gotta spend some time on and figure out if you wanna even set a minimum and a maximum. Let's go on. Uh, so, blending them in, um, usually there are some sort of architectural standards to make sure that happens. Uh, you know, the appearance of a duplex, is that an issue in your community? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, you may want to worry about where the doors are um, and making sure the addition somehow, uh, you know, helps with the architecture of the regular home. Um, in the backyard, I, again, I've not really seen so much for that issue if you're gonna do a detached uh, unit in the back, um, but uh, there may be some standards. Uh, do you want the storage container in the back that uh, has been not painted for 20 years and uh, you know looks pretty bad, but who really sees that? So a lot of discussion about uh, what to do in the backyard. Let's move on. Uh, parking, you saw that actually was fairly high on Jake's list there too. Uh, do you require additional parking or not? Um, can you look at it as this is just a bigger family that's in the house and uh, yes, they're parking on the street. Is that okay? I know one Mill Creek uh, meeting I went to, uh, somebody at the table I was at was freaking out about people parking on the street, but is that illegal? Um, maybe only during a snowstorm and uh, if you got lots of kids with cars, I don't know how else you handle that. Anyhow, uh, parking is an issue. Uh, most common we see as one off street, sometimes more, um, but I think it is something to grapple with in your community and say, do we really need that? Is it okay if that uh, um, person uh, renting down there has a car and it's on the street? So moving on. Uh, utilities connect separately or not. I think the debate here is uh, mostly uh, how independent do you want that unit to become? Um, are we le leaning towards someday where we could have condominiums within a single family home? Uh, is that an issue or not? Uh, as far as the mailbox and the unit number is concerned, it, it really is something that you got to have, uh, right? Because you don't want emergency folks showing up at your home and wondering what unit they need to go to, right? So you need an address. Let's move on. Uh, building code. Um, they're giving you some great pictures of some interesting places in the Caribbean that have no building code. Um, anyhow, uh, so this is actually one of the bigger hurdles um, because uh, a separate unit has to meet the building code and there's really no way out of that. I'm gonna talk in a minute about illegal units and obviously the illegal ones have the biggest hurdle to become legal. They have uh, so many things that they have to address in the building code. Uh, so life safety issues have to be addressed. You gotta have the firewalls if that's in the house or an addition. Um, I think even over the garage too, for that matter. Um, Separate heating, functional escape windows. If you're in the basement, most of us have these little teeny windows uh, that are really pretty useless if you have a fire, um, but they, they need to be enlarged and they need to have access to the electrical panel. So building code, uh, you know, we tend to think about ourselves as zoning only, but uh, we shouldn't. Uh, the building code is a big piece of this, okay? Moving on. Maybe, there we go, processing. Okay, um, this is another interesting debate. In, um, <laughs> and thanks Kurt for that comment, that's interesting. He's never seen a tiny house meet the building code. Okay, um, uh, let's see. Uh, so processing, do you wanna make them a permitted use or a conditional use? So generally speaking, if you think about these components that we have in the ordinance, we have a lot of components, right? Um, a lot of things we're trying to address. So for, I know for Meg and I, <laughs> that's, that pushes us toward the permitted use side of these kinds of things. 
You got a lot of standards, you got a lot of requirements. What do you want to go to some kind of hearing for? Um, but there's a lot of communities that want to do them as conditional use. And as you see down below, below there, um, you know, you get the folks that come out and say, we shouldn't allow this to happen. Um, you know, they're going to park on the street. Oh, no. Uh, all those kinds of things. And uh, you just, I wonder if the hearing is worthwhile um, where you've got lots of standards. So uh, this issue that uh, Jake's poll uh, addressed of the area, some communities have just done certain areas near transit and others have done the whole city. So uh, some things to think through. But I would suggest to you that if you've got a lot of standards, keep it as a permitted use. Uh, impact fees, you're gonna charge them an impact fee. This is just uh, another thing that's another impediment uh, to doing an ADU. Um, do they really have much more of an impact? I think that's a good question. Some communities are charging exactly the same as a new single family home. Um, strikes me as that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, and if you really wanna encourage uh, ADUs, maybe you don't charge. And just think about it as a larger extended family. Let's go on. Interesting. And Paul's telling us, I'm sorry if Meg, you wanted to do this, but <laughs> Paul's telling us that uh, uh, yesterday, Senator Anderegg was wondering if we ought to be allowed to charge for an impact fee at all. Okay, illegal units, uh, can you have a yurt in the back? Um, Kurt mentioned that uh, he's never seen a tiny home meet a building code. I'm pretty sure uh, yurts have a tough time too. Um, but, um, so we saw that a lot of communities have a bunch of illegal units. Um, I think it's nice to try to make them legal, um, but to get people to come in and address you know, thousands of dollars of building code issues, that's a problem. But they really have to do that, right? I mean, as a community, you don't want uh, somebody to die in a fire that maybe would have been prevented if you met the building code, right? So um, that's a big one, though. You saw that little list. Um, I know the league has a brochure that has a much longer list, but uh, that is something to consider um, how could you make them legal? All right, and we're moving on to Aaron. <laughs> Thank you. And you got to unmute or try to unmute. Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for having Mill Creek join the conversation. I just want to start off by saying we're in the middle of working on our ordinance. So this is a nice Hopefully a nice example for anyone who hasn't started the process yet to kind of see what we did, what we've gone through so far. Um, we have a current draft, but again, our draft is still subject to change as I go through this presentation. Just keep that in mind. Um, so just some general things. If any, for anyone who doesn't know, we just became a city in 2016 and we just got our first wonderful general plan ever in 2019. And so these are just some highlights that you're seeing on the screen of um, what, what we call out as our current housing stock that we're seeing in Mill Creek. And, you know, we're just south of Salt Lake City. We're a pretty built out city. So we have very established neighborhoods. We've been here for a while. So we have about 52% single family. And you can kind of see after that, it's apartment townhouse style. So we're kind of missing some middle ground here. And um, definitely the city council as one of our first housing um, actions just kind of thought, and we are hearing it from a lot of residents too, that the ADU ordinance was just going to be a first step for the city as starting our house, building up on our housing plan and our housing initiatives. So we started that route in 2018. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, so we started planning this in 2018, and I think as learning from all the other cities and seeing what other cities kind of went through in adoption and in public process, our biggest thing was, okay, we're gonna spend a lot of time up front doing public engagement and um, identifying problems. And that was a lot. So it was really a lot of time of having our policy team do a lot of research, comparisons to other ordinances. But then we spent a lot of time getting the NIMBY, anyone who had NIMBYism to come out to our open houses and anyone who wanted an ADU ordinance to come out and we got them talking. 
And that kind of played into how we crafted our ordinance. If you want to go to the next slide. It helped us collect a lot of, because we're such a new city, it helped us collect a lot of wonderful research about how, how people and residents see our neighborhoods now. Um, and it definitely helped us get right out of the way some of the main problems that we as planners already know ha that come up during the AD ordinance, but we heard it a lot from residents in our open house. And it was nice to have that kind of background of hearing them talk about parking density issues, permitting process, all the same things that we as staff kind of knew we had to tackle, but it was really nice having that backbone from the residents to kind of carry through our public process. And then some other questions we asked in our surveys was, we kind of asked people to share stories about what kind of ADU they may already have. Um, do they want to build an ADU? Why do they want to build it? So we can kind of get both sides talking. So we had a big, a lot of big engagement about the pros and the cons and where that's coming from. You want to go to the next slide? Oh, did I miss it? Oh. Um, so then all that kind of culminated into us crafting a pretty unique ordinance. I feel like our current draft, we can kind of go through and point, here's exactly what happened in the public process that kind of put it into our ordinance, um, as well as some standard practices and guidelines that we have we've know as planners is gonna be helpful and help mitigate concerns and stuff. So one of the big things in our ordinance that we did is we tackled attached ADUs and detached ADUs differently and especially in the permitting process. And that kind of came from public engagement and um, research about what were our currently existing conditions in our city for our lots. Can you go to the next one? Um, so as far as our lot qualifiers, we looked at what our existing lots look like, where we think most of these illegal ADUs are hiding, what types they're at and what type of lot they're on. Um, that was a lot of like GIS kind of based research, um, as well as like standard owner occupancy requirement for a lot, um, single family zoning, obviously. But some of these other details came from like research done um, on the staff side that we thought would be, is like the most middle ground, like most of our lots in our city are 8,000 square feet or above. And the next slide. So basically, um, our attached ADUs are much more relaxed in our ordinance, and that's because we have so many existing ones. So we wanted people to be encouraged to come get them, try and get them approved, because we don't know what building code conflicts they're going to run into anyways. So we kind of wanted to make that easier on people. We also kind of treat it as if it's just one single family house, but then we kind of just reduce the use size. So we reduce the number of bedrooms occupancy, like uh, most standard ordinances do. And then obviously the, we do allow detached in our current draft and um, the current detached draft has a lot more strict design standards. It doesn't have any architectural standards, but it does have um, like strict height requirements and setbacks and stuff. And Aaron, uh, Aaron I'm gonna jump in for a sec. Yeah. Uh, gentleman had a uh, uh, question a about lot? what is a flag lot? Oh, um, we have a lot of these in Mill Creek. Typically, if you have a traditional rectangular lot and you want to put a house in the backyard, you can subdivide it so that there's a driveway going to the back of the lot and there's a house back there, but they're two separate properties. So it looks like a flagpole going to the back. Um, so basically, flag lots are technically like ADUs, but they've been subdivided off. They, they look similar to like what an ADU is already, but one is separate ownership and one is one whole ownership. So we just said, kind of to mitigate density, we said flag lots already have one house, so they can't have another house. So that it's technically three in one spot, if that makes sense. Does that, does that kind of clear it, clear it up? Um, okay, I hope that clarifies it. But um, then one of the reasons are detached, um, ADU requirements are much stricter. Again, comes from the public outreach that we had where people were kept talking. We kind of found in all of our open houses, they would just kind of sideswipe attached ADUs and they'd go immediately to, well, you're gonna put this huge thing in my backyard. It's gonna be this tall, it's gonna be that. They always go to the, the detached ADU kind of concept and 
people who don't want those, that's always kind of what's in their mind. So we're like, okay, we're going to put some heavier requirements over here where people are thinking that's going to be the most um, troublesome as an adjacent neighbor to them. You want to go to the next slide? And then our public, our current um, processes that we've adopted is we're doing the ADU administratively and then the detached is a conditional use permit. This, as um, as John kind of said, it's it's up in the air. It's very like difficult to figure out permitting processes because we have discussed doing it through a business license as well in our city. And I think it's an ongoing discussion about whether we're going to do a CUP, um, what's going to be done administratively. And um, we're still in the discussion of, well, if we're going to put all these requirements up, should we just make it permitted or not? But this is the current draft of what we've got. And then I'll go to the next slide. So then the main um, things I just wanted to highlight for us as a city developing a new ordinance was we had so many existing, we're a completely built out city, we had so many existing ADUs that we knew were there. And that's as a result of our city used to be, um, a large portion of it used to be zoned for duplexes. And then it got down zoned after all those duplexes were built to R1. So we have a lot of non-conforming attached ADUs, which kind of also led us to our permitting process being easier for attached. Um, as well as some of our lots in our city are not to standard there. We have a lot of non-conforming lots. So it was kind of difficult to figure out a standard for minimum lot size and setbacks and stuff like that. And then I think another one is because our public process has been so long, like um, maybe more so than other cities, keeping residents involved to the end has been one thing that staff is trying to work for. Now that we're kind of have a draft and we're like getting closer to public meetings and adoption, we're trying to keep those residents informed and keep them. And then obviously what John said, preserving the neighborhood characteristic. So we don't have any design guidelines updated yet. And uh, adopting this ordinance was a little hard to kind of craft for Maybe we'll get some design guidelines later or have neighborhood design guidelines. So that's been something to think about for us. And that's the end of mine, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Daniel, it's your turn. Uh, pardon my title there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I just changed that from uh, a little while back. It, uh, it's an interesting transition, city trying to put one together versus a city that uh, has had them for a long time. After you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Daniel, Daniel Cardenas. I'm the Community Development Director for Plaster Grove City. Uh, I, I want to start this, uh, what, what I have, five minutes, 10 minutes, uh, this little presentation by telling you uh, two, two more than obvious uh, truths, two uh, undeniable, unquestionable situations, all right? And especially I'm talking to uh, um, um, uh, officials, to city officials, uh, elected and appointed. Here's the thing, rule number, I mean, through number one, I'm Mexican, I have an accent, all right? That's clear. So be, bear with me. If you guys don't understand, please uh, send the message. Through number two, uh, your municipalities, guys, your jurisdictions uh, are already full Right now, they have plenty of accessory apartments. Some of those you guys don't know, but they're right there. They're already there. And there's no uh, need to lie to ourselves. They're right there and there will be more. Wanting them or not. Let's be honest with that, okay? They're gonna be there. Their need for housing, it's, it's big. Uh, your residents are gonna find a way to do it and they're gonna do it. So, I'm pretty sure most of you guys are familiar with the story of the, uh, the Dutch boy that had to put the little finger right there on the leaking dike. Um, Blasting Grove City got tired of uh, putting the finger on the leaking dike. Okay, we, we knew we had accessory apartments. We we're spending a lot of money uh, on code enforcement, a lot of headaches, a lot of yelling, a lot of problems sending uh, code enforcement to all these homes. And it was kind of difficult to, to tackle the issue. So then we, again, Plus and Grove City, the, the officials who play a really big role in this, and I'm talking about elected and appointing officials, city council, planning commission, fine, because the staff already wanted it. I mean, it would be easier for staff to, to, to find a way to, to make them permit it. 
Uh, so again, Planning Commission, City Council, they got together and they said, hey, we gotta find a, a, a solution for this problem. My code enforcement guy spends 70% uh, of his time chasing these problems or so-called problems that they should not be a problems. Um, so let's figure out a situation. So <clears throat> we realized that Plus and Grove City in the past, in the past, we actually uh, allow, used to allow uh, um, accessory apartments. Uh, they, we stopped allowing them in 1985. For some reason, we thought hmm, that maybe that's the, uh, I don't know why I, I, I wasn't in the United States. I mean, I wasn't even born around that time, but something happened. Some ideas came out that they decide let's uh, prohibit them, right? And it was time to, to get our minds away from that uh, prohibition uh, approach. What Plas and Grove City did around that time is they asked themselves, why not? I mean, what are the problems? What are the, the nuisances? What are the, the situations? What are the, the things that are impeding us? Or, or, or what are the reasons why we're not having accessory apartments, right? So that was the approach that we took. Ask what are the problems? And let's see if we can figure out in a way by writing code, how to tackle, how to uh, minimize, uh, mitigate, or even eliminate some of those possible negative effects. So it took, some, it took some work, right? I mean, we have to get the public together. We have to do some open houses. Uh, again, uh, multiple planning commission meetings. Um, when, when we had the public come and, and the public came and they expressed their concerns, the situations, why? We, most of us know what, what they are, right? So what we decided to do at that time or the approach that we decided to take was, okay, let's make them permitted, but with a registration. Let's figure out what the problems are what the uh, possible nuisance might be, and let's figure out if we can tackle them, okay? Again, we all know what those are. For example, um, uh, people were concerned about uh, the properties being run down. That, that, that's, a, that's a common concern. People say, well, if people who rent don't take care of their properties. How do we solve that situation? And I think a lot of jurisdictions have done it. They make them owner occupied. Right? I mean, people take pride of the, of the place they live and more if they own it. So let's make them owner occupied. Again, the public come and they, the public come and complain and say, hey, my neighbor's place is going to go run down. And then we come out with a, with a solution. Well, how about we make it owner occupied so your neighbor's still going to be there? Okay, well, it, it, it makes sense. Um, another problem, another concern people had is uh, uh, code enforcement goes and then they try to talk to the people that have a mess in there. and, and and people come out and say, hey, we're just renters. Well, if you make them owner occupied, they get to talk to right the owner right there. He, he, he's got to leave right there. So uh, we, we talk about that. Um, we talk about also, for example, what type of units should we allow? And in that case, I got to give props to Plus and Grove City officials and staff. They were pretty open. We say, detach, attach. It doesn't matter if it's a basement. It doesn't matter if it's an addition. It doesn't matter if it's on top of a detached structure. It doesn't matter if it's, a, hey, throw, throw tiny homes in the mix right there. Why not? Let's work on it. Let's figure out a way. It's gonna happen anyway. They're gonna find a way. The pressure of the water on the dike is too much that there's gonna be a way they're gonna find out. If the only space they have is on top of their garage, they're gonna do it on top of their garage. They're gonna find a way. So, why not let's make them uh, permitted then? Let's figure out, let's work with the uh, building official, let's work with the uh, engineer department, let's work with public works, let's work with the fire department, let's find out a way. So we decided to make them, uh, or to allow them anywhere in the city that allows a residential use. If, he, he, if it allows a residential use, and if there is space, put it in there, no biggie, okay? So that's the approach that we took. Uh, like I say, we even, Put tiny homes right there. Hey, let's let's find a way to do it. Um, we have so many uh, uh, concerns again, and, and not just concerns from the public. We have concerns from from fire departments. We have concerns from uh, from engineers, right? I mean, that those guys always throw uh, a wrench into the mix. That they they, they, they they come with this uh, situation that they, they they see, and we have to work with all of them. It, it was a team effort on how to come up with it. Um, again, we try to react to possible nuisances, possible problems. Uh, if, if we can go to the next, the, the next uh, slide, I think we even, uh, like, like how are they gonna get the mail? Well, let's, let's, let's put a B in there, let's, let's figure out a way. Uh, if we approach this issue 
with the mentality of finding solutions is easier than if we approach it, uh, uh, you know, just, just blocking ourselves. There's a solution for them because again, the issue or the situation is going to happen. It's just a matter of how the city is going to react to it. Um, the biggest issue, the biggest issue we had was in regards to parking. And, and, and that is something that we had to uh, work hard, again, not just with the public, but with the rest of the departments in the city, because, um, you know, the, the biggest complaint or when people realize that there's an accessory apartment is because there's too many cars on the street, right? I mean, that's, I, I think that's the number one clue that lets you know that my neighbor has uh, uh, an accessory apartment or something like that. So um, we were trying to meet in the middle. If it was up to a staff, I would have required only one more extra parking stall. But, I mean, we have to work and we have to, to a certain degree, to appease the concerns of the public and of the, the, the officials. So we end up requiring two, okay? That's something that until this until today kind of gives me a little bit of heartburn. Uh, for a single family dwelling, for example, we require four parking stalls. Uh, I mean, the, the, the two car garage and um, the two cars that usually go on the driveway. And then what we decide to do is now to require two more. Now it, it, it's, it's six of them. Um, in my opinion, again, this is personal opinion, is a lot. But again, we have to work. We have to figure somehow uh, a middle ground. We have to find out a, a, a solution. And then we require two different, I'm uh, sorry, two additional uncover space, cover if they want to, uncover if they want to. Uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be concrete or asphalt. So we have to work with some uh, a, a cheaper situation. And we come out with engineering, we work, we travel a couple of uh, sites, we realized that if we put some compact uh, crushed granite, it, it, it work out and, and we wouldn't drag stuff into the, into the um, drainage and whatever. So again, we, we trying to uh, find, uh, see a problem, trying to find a solution or, or um, a situation, something that can mitigate the problem. Can we go to the next slide? Um, you know, uh, this, uh, it's going to be an ongoing situation. We, uh, the ordinance the Plus and Grove City has is not perfect. Um, close to be, but not. <laughs> we still have some issues. So some situations we got to figure out. We still, I still get some phone calls. I still get some situations. Um, and, and for example, uh, I was listening to John. I was listening to Erin and, and how they, they may think about doing into the business licenses. We don't do it like that. We just do one time uh, registration. Um, they come to the front counter. I give them, we give them a, like a handout with all the rules. And then um, we don't do a, an, an annual renewal. Okay. Uh, but we got to, so the hardest part with to do a one time or one time only registration is that around that time, the, the property owner uh, says he's going to live on the property. But then it's different, it's difficult. So it's difficult to track it after that. It's complicated. After two years, he's going to sell it. And, and he's going to move somewhere else. And maybe someone who wants to rent two units is going to buy it. We're trying to figure out a, um, a way or a situation to avoid that. To be honest with you guys, like in the last um, four years, I have had like maybe one or two cases of that. Uh, it's not a big deal, but it is a problem. I mean, I, I understand the, the, the situation there. Um, difficult to enforce short-term rentals. Um, you know what? I, I like to take pride and say that Plus and Grove City is ahead of the curve in regard of accessory apartments, but we're way behind on, on short-term rentals. This is my goal. Next time I'm going to start working on, on that, and I'm going to try to figure out a way how to mesh those two, those two together. Um, cluster mailboxes, we have some issues with the, uh, the delivery of the mail. Uh, this is very important. Fear of registering, okay? I was checking, and, and in the last year, the last year I had a total of about 80 to, yeah, I don't know if it's 80 or 87 uh, uh, accessory apartments registered with the city. Uh, not a lot, I'm pretty sure there's more. What I'm, what I'm thinking is that for so long, for so long, people have been getting in their minds that this is illegal, this is a bad thing, that they have fear of coming and, 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 and showing up. I'm, I'm planning on doing a, a heavy, I'm still trying to do a heavy um, um, campaign to let the public know that we're open. As long as they follow the rules, the city is open to do something like that. Um, so the public perception, they're still a little, a little hesitant to do it. But you know, an interesting thing uh, that is happening in the city is that I will say 
about half of the new dwellings, half of the new building permits that I'm issuing on for single family, they already come with an accessory apartment. That, that's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And, and I mean, we throw the numbers right there. And in this area, it's hard for right now, it's hard to find a home that is a brand new home that is less than half a million dollars. I don't know how much you guys, you, how much you guys make, but I cannot afford half a million dollar home. I cannot. Right. But if he has a, an accessory dwelling, hey, there's a little bit of income right there. I can work out something with my bank. So new building permits are already coming attached with the desire to pursue that situation. Do I have another uh, another slide or that's that's all I have? I think I have one more. Uh, this ordinance have a big positive impact, big positive impact on, on, on my community. Um, again, I have had maybe two calls, three calls in, in four years of problems that I have with accessory apartments. When before, I remember when I used to work for, 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 for Sally County and, and I was uh, taking care of Mill Creek a little bit, Erin, I used to get every day, every day I used to get this phone call about accessory apartments. Like, hey, my neighbor is having a, 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 an illegal one. And, and then I will answer the phone and they will be complaining about it. And then they will get mad at me and then they will say, What's next, Mexicans? And I'll be like, hey, buddy, you, you need to see who you're talking to right now. So it's a problem I don't have anymore. It's a problem I don't have anymore. Yes, I do have some phone calls. I, I Like I said, the ordinance is not perfect, but it has had a big impact, right? I mean, people have cleaned up the, the front yards. People have, are taking care of it, and, and I'm not struggling a lot with that. When I did my uh, uh, the, the affordable housing project the, the, and was checking my existing housing stock, I did see it. I did see a, an improvement on certain areas right there. Um, it, it, you know, I was I was again uh, working in a it, Pleasant Grove City is almost built out. If you guys take a look at the map, I don't have many more areas where I can do residential, uh, re, uh, more single family dwellings. So having uh, the opportunity to have an accessory apartment. Um, has helped us a lot, has helped us a lot. People usually come and they, and they say, hey, I, I want my kids to still live in the city, but there's no place where to buy. Again, uh, half a million dollars, $700,000 homes, they just graduated from college. I want them to live in the city. How am I gonna do that? Well, we have accessory apartments allowed in the city. Again, put them in your garage, put them on top of your garage, underneath your garage, whatever. Just make sure you have enough parking, make sure you don't make a mess and we're all good. Again, guys, I want to just finish this by saying, um, let's not be blind. Let's not be blind to a situation that is, it's right there, guys. It's right there. Whether we want to see it or not, it's right there and it's going to get bigger. People are going to look for places. It's a beautiful place, beautiful place to live. We're looking for um, places where to stay that, that are um, uh, uh, dignified, a place to, 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 to live. So that's what I have, guys. Again, Plus and Growth, I think we have been successful about it. Thank you very much for listening to me, and uh, hopefully my accent wasn't too, 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 too heavy to understand. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Daniel. That was great. Um, and I think, again, the interesting perspective. I know where Daniel used to work. Uh, they didn't allow ADUs, right? So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting transition. So uh, we've got the chat button there. Um, does anybody have some questions? Uh, is anybody thinking this might help them? Uh, well, let's see. Okay. Um, and we have uh, fans uh, from Mayor Dirk Burton, Daniel. Um, so um, questions? Anyone want to discuss an issue? It seems like between the four of us, we've hit most of the issues, I think. But uh, um, what can we help you with? OK. So this would be for Aaron and Daniel. Do either of your cities charge additional impact fees for ADUs? I guess in Aaron's case, be, are you thinking about it? And Daniel, what do you do? We don't. We don't. OK. What do you think? And you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm always muted. Um, we are not considering it at the time. It's been discussed. I definitely don't think, especially how young we are as a city as a whole, I don't think we're going to be charging any. Uh, I want to add one 
One thing to that, uh, when we had this discussion uh, before at an APA conference, um, Daniel, I think I remember Pleasant Grove, it's a $50 fee, is that right? Uh, yes, it's a $50 fee, but that's what, it's more like administrative, because that's what it takes my planner to actually go and take a look that there's enough parking and, and, and stuff like that, yes. Absolutely, and one of Pleasant Grove's neighbors, I'm not gonna say which city it is, but they're in the thousands of dollars, I think it was 3,000 that I remember for an ADU, and, and that's a pretty big obstacle. For, for a homeowner to add a kitchen, remodel a bathroom, and then have to pay a 3,000 fee on top of that, that could be an obstacle. All right, uh, so generally we're thinking about this as just an enlarged family uh, in the original home. Um, so, um, from Seth, uh, didn't hear if this is covered. Any cities require separate utility meters? I can answer that, John, if you would like. Please. I, I, I don't require them. I, I allow them, either or, I don't require them. I think uh, most of the uh, owners, they will, if they're gonna rent it out, sometimes they would like to get a different, uh, a different meter just so they can pay utilities or figure things out like that. Some cities, do not allow them. I know for a fact some cities do not allow them, but we, we do allow them. I mean, if they want to keep your utilities under the same meter, okay. If they don't want to, it's up to them. We, we leave it to the, to, to the appropriate. Pleasant Grove's flexible. What are we proposing in Mill Creek? I live in Mill Creek, by the way. Um, we're saying no to separate utilities. We are going the route that we don't want it to be sold off in the future as a separate house. Um, and in our research, significantly across the board, most of the cities in Salt Lake County and Utah County seem to not allow them. It's to be separate, okay. It's a very substantial cost. You think about uh, going out and having that separate connection at the street, bringing those pipes out, the separate meters, that, that, that again can add very substantial. And yet, if you're requiring owner-occupied, then you just include it in your rent or charge your tenant. You know, it's, it's yeah. With a single unit, it's, it's not a big deal to have it as part of it. Okay. Um, Paul, I'm going to say yes, you did miss it. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Um, Paul and I used to work together. But uh, yeah, Mill Creek and actually Pleasant Grove, I'm not sure about American Fork, um, they're not charging for impact fees. So uh, from Patricia, we have much of Utah growth is from out of the state. How can we be confident that ADU properties will stay owner occupied? We have found with short term rentals in our city, now most are owned by out of state investors and are driven, driving the prices up beyond what locals can afford. Uh, so I did have, I'm just going to start the answer and then I'll let you guys continue, but some um, uh, suggestions in that one slide on components. First is this recorded document says the owner's going to live in the house. Okay, recorded, you know, not just put in the file over someplace, um, but actually recorded. And then I still am suggesting the business license. I know in Pleasant Grove, we're thinking about that. It's, it's obviously one more pain in the neck uh, for all of us to kind of do that every year, but uh, that is a way to check up on it. And if it is standard that it, they're actually making money on these things, then it is a business, right? So in my mind, those are the things that can be done. Uh, I've not run into the situation yet of trying to enforce that, <laughs> but uh, obviously you need to have some fees or something or fines, excuse me, that would maybe take care of that. Other thoughts, Daniel and Aaron there. That, uh, that is the, the, the biggest hurdle I've seen right now after we have implemented the code. What we also do is we have a document that we record with the county, okay? We have a document that we record. Uh, and in the document, it's, it, it's an affidavit where the property owner uh, certifies right there that while he's gonna use the accessory apartment, the property is gonna be owner occupied. Whoever he sells the property also, he has to live in the property for or in order to the to the accessory apartment to be to be legal. Um, I have like two or three cases, like I said, in four years. I'm, I'm, I, I like the idea of a business license. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm trying to, I need to figure out a way not to charge them and possibly do it. Of course, I don't want to do a conditional use permit. It's, uh, I mean, the noticing and stuff like that's going to be a pain. I have hundreds of those right now. 
Um, so maybe the business license idea of some type of a yearly review is a good idea. I still, I haven't settled on something like that. But again, we started with a recorded document uh, that the property owner at that time signs, whoever buys the property, every time there's a change of ownership, they need to sign that in order for the accessory apartment to be legal, it has to be owner occupied. Okay. Aaron, uh, approach in Mill Creek. Yeah, we're doing almost the same thing. If it's, if uh, owner occupancy changes, they have to come back to the city and reestablish that recorded affidavit. Um, we've thought, again, we've thought about the business licensing side, pros and cons of that. I know a couple of our staff think that that's the better way to go. We're still not decided on how we're going to continually do that, but definitely an affidavit rec recording of the property. Yeah. Okay, um, hopefully that answered that question. The next one we have is, uh, do we inspect for smoke alarms and other safety systems? Um, I know Kurt's on here somewhere, or at least was, uh, who's uh, in the building inspection world, and the answer I'm pretty sure is yes. Oh, for sure, for sure. If you will yeah. do it in addition for something like that, for sure, they have to pass that building uh, requirements as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, and again, that's just a little piece of the hurdles from the building inspection world. Okay. Uh, there, there are a lot, especially for those basement apartments. I mean, in West Valley, we used to have these ones that would be uh, converted canning kitchens. <laughs> um, you know, suddenly they're adding a bathroom and boom, it's rented. Um, so, you know, those things just need to be inspected and make sure they're safe. Um, Next one, short-term rentals. How are we addressing short-term rentals? Are we doing that different from ADUs? I, I guess just to frame that for a minute for myself, uh, you know, short-term rental could be the whole house, right? Not just uh, an ADU. Uh, so that may be one way to look at them as different, but I'm sure that some people are wanting to do ADUs to do short-term rentals, right? Um, make some pretty good money as long as you like to clean up every week. Um, <laughs> anyway, thoughts? Um, um, oh. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, for Mill Creek, actually, right now, we say that they're not allowed in the designated ADU. So if there's an ADU in the backyard or something, you can't use that. You can still use the main house. That's kind of due to the fact that we are currently working on a short-term rental ordinance that's a little more strict. So um, I think we're keeping them separate for the time being. Okay. PG does not allow um, um, short-term rentals at this point. We're a beautiful city, but we don't have a big demand for who wants to come to. <laughs> Finally, had our first hotel. So I guess it wasn't a big demand for hotels either, but we got one now. <laughs> uh, I'm planning on working on, on, on drafting something. For sure, when I work on this, on, on, on a, a short-term rental, I need to figure out how that's gonna mesh with my already in place ADU ordinance, but right now PG does not regulate, I mean, does not allow uh, short-term rentals. Okay. Um, the next question was, uh, how often are we inspecting as a community? So, um, a general answer in my mind for that would be, you're inspecting initially with all the installation of the improvements. Um, hopefully those are lasting a long time. Uh, the only other opportunity in my mind is uh, with a change, a, an annual business license or a change in the owner's kind of business license. Um, but uh, again, I'd throw that out as what are, what are the thoughts? Anyone? Um. Yes, is it, I, I only inspected at the at the um, at the time of submittal, and then when there's a change of ownership. Yeah, so I mean, if you think about that too, from an apartment complex point of view, you don't inspect every time a tenant changes, right? Uh, so I don't think that actually happens. Um, I know that happens if they're on Section Eight funding or some kind of a. Uh, uh, government subsidize deal, but um, it really doesn't happen in the regular apartments. Um, so I don't know that business license creates the opportunity, I guess, to do that. So, okay. Um, any other 
summary questions. We got about five minutes, maybe, or maybe it's lunchtime. Or lollipop time. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, this is from Jake. <laughs> Jake says, good job. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the questions. I think the questions really help these uh, video chat things uh, work a little better, make it more interesting. Get tired of seeing our four faces and uh, big PowerPoint on the screen the whole time. So can I, can I just say one more thing. Um, okay. I, I I know you guys are not afraid, but I'm gonna say this: don't, don't be afraid to get in touch with Plus and Grove City. I'm um, I'm willing to share my ordinance with anybody who wants to take a look at it. I just barely uh, talked to um, American Fork. I've been talking to Lyndon. Um, yeah, I I like to share the love. Yeah, maybe that is a an idea that we ought to toss out. Uh, I'm aware of a few that I think are. Um, have been established besides Pleasant Grove. Uh, Sandy's had one for a long time. Um, North Salt Lake adopted one two years ago, maybe. It seemed really comprehensive. It even covers like if you're going to be gone for two years on a mission or something like that. Uh, I mean, it, it uh, gets into all kinds of issues. So there's some good examples out there. Um, some things to, to take a look at. Uh, it does seem like we need more housing opportunity. So uh, this is one way to address that. Any other parting thoughts? Anyone? Just want to say thank you to our audience. A lot of great questions. Thank you to Daniel, Aaron, and John. Really good presentations and discussion. And hopefully in a few years, we're, we're looking at numbers and, and comparing ADUs with apartments and homes. And we see how it fits into the overall housing stock. All right. Well, I think we're going to sign off. Um, thank you all. Thank you, panelists. And uh, thank you all for participating. Appreciate it.